It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Bob Yandian, and we're going to be discussing his new book, Theology Simplified, The Eight Foundational Truths of Your Glorious Redemption. Bob, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, Bob, it's been about a year since we last spoke. We always have new people signing on, listening and watching the show. So I want to make sure we allow them to get to know you a little bit. So let's start likely the same place we did last time. And that's with a little bit of the Bob Yandian origin story. For anybody meeting you for the first time in our talk today, what are a few things they should know about you? Well, I was born into a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. At five years old, I started attending church. And uh, honestly, I was there every Sunday, every Sunday night, every midweek night. So I was raised around church, but had a call to the ministry. And that really came to me my junior year. I was at Oklahoma State University, and God spoke to me that I would be going into the ministry as a teacher. And so uh, I, I loved it and went to Bible school. And really what, what fascinated me was I, I enjoyed teaching on a, high, on a uh, Bible school level. To teach students is really one of the greatest things that, and things that I'm really doing now it's kind of like toward the end of my life, God's really brought me back around to teaching Bible school students. And one thing I enjoy is taking uh, difficult things that people think are difficult or only for ministers and making it understandable. I pastored for 33 years and told my congregation, I'm going to treat you like Bible school students. You're going to walk out of here smarter, but I'm also going to make it so simple you can't miss it. My whole concept is if a mother can't sit there in church and then use this sermon tomorrow morning while she's making tuna fish sandwiches for her children for school, something was wrong with my sermon. And there's no such thing, such as even over Timothy or Titus, there's no no line up there that says these are pastoral books. We make them pastoral books. If they're really pastoral books, then what are they doing in the Bible for everybody else to read? There's nothing in there that isn't down to earth for us. And I believe that's what Jesus did. If Jesus ever saw himself going over somebody's head, he would throw a parable in there. And say, this is like a woman putting, uh, you know, putting leaven into a loaf of bread or catching fish or planting a seed. He made it so understandable that there was no complex. So I like to take what seemingly in our brain says this is complex and make it a usable everyday thing. That's why I taught the book on Theology Simplified. Well, we were talking about this uh, a few minutes ago before we got into the interview. Uh, I grew up in the Lutheran church, got to go through confirmation, had the honor of uh, going to Bible college. And I realize for a lot of church contexts, they, they've they lost kind of that foundation of getting into the creeds mm-hmm. and church history. It's just not a normal rhythm and flow of somebody coming up through the ranks, so to speak, uh, as they're going through Sunday school and, and growing up in church and whatnot. Um, I'd love for you to speak a little bit to, uh, in terms of this project, the need for a book like Theology Simplified. And, and I guess I'm thinking of it from the perspective of As we look at everything that seems to be new under the sun, but the church has wrestled with before, I feel like it's easier for us to be led astray or just kind of get into some things that's a little bit off base without a base level of theology under our belts. So talk to us about the need for a book like Theology Simplified. Why is that important? It's because most ministers today don't understand theology. They don't go back and study it from people that studied the, the, uh, the history of the Bible or the Greek or the Hebrew. And again, I'm not saying take Greek and Hebrew and and act like you're superior to everybody. Make it to where you use that to make it down to earth, where people can use it every single day, including ministers and what ministers are doing today. There's there's a story in the Old Testament of Elisha. Elisha was an old man, and he surrounded himself with the students uh, from the school of the prophets. And one day it said there was a a, a famine in the land, and he sent the young people out and said, let's have lunch. And he said, go out and gather together some vegetables. Well, one young student, bright-eyed, probably full of naive as could be, ran out and grabbed some wild gourds and didn't know the difference between that and a zucchini and brought it back and cut it up and it it was poison. And one of the students yelled out and said to to the prophet, said, there's poison in the pot. And what Elisha did, he never got upset, stood up and threw flour into it. That's amazing. One translation said cornmeal. And what it was, was young people today are running out into the fields and bringing back stuff that's poisoned, but they don't know it in their, in their naivety. They're saying, oh, this is good stuff because brother so-and-so preached it. And they don't understand it contradicts the word of God. It takes an old man to throw flour into the pot, which is basics. 
throw the basics in there, and that answers the question. And what's missing today is they don't understand the basics of the Word of God. They're looking for great sermons and, and wild sermons, and anything to bring people in, and looking for their heroes among the 20 and 30 years. And there's nothing wrong with that, except that the guys that are out there that have been around for years can tell you, no. You know this last problem they had with the 737 jet? Did you know part of the problem was the aeronautics of that plane? It wouldn't fly. Unless the engines were running, it wouldn't fly. What kept it up was the engines, not the wings. And the old men that they fired years ago came back and said, guys, you're missing the whole thing. You don't understand aeronautics. You know, the reason why these things are crashing, if an engine goes out, the plane goes down immediately. You need something that'll still float. And they didn't understand that. The, young, the younger men that were there kept thinking computers would answer everything. When it does, sometimes it's, it's more basic than that, a person understanding. And I'm seeing that today. And so that's why I wrote the book. I want people to understand this is not hard. This is not rocket science. It's simple. If you just understand the meaning of a Greek word, how it's used in context, and how you can use it for your own people to keep them back to the basics. It's like trying to understand trigonometry, but you never learned it, learned addition and subtraction. You've got to start from there and build up to it. So that's why that's why I wrote the book. Well, and I, I, I like the illustrations that you've just shared. I think, you know, for a lot of us, when we're in our 20s, 30s, and even into our early 40s, uh, we want recognition. We think we have a lot of wisdom. I, I, I feel like as a guy who's 43, I'm just starting to get a level of experience and wisdom yeah. that is coming together where I may have something worth while to say and maybe it's just the tyranny of of uh, something that happens when we're young where we don't necessarily want to listen to those that are older than us yet often those are exactly the people that we need mentoring us and speaking yeah. into our lives and sharing uh what we've learned and so uh if you are a younger person and you can come under some level of mentorship uh, of a person who's you know i'm always looking for people who are 15 to 20 years further down the path than me those yeah. are the people that i want speaking into my life because you know, the the ditches I'm falling into, the holes I'm encountering in the road I'm walking, they've already encountered all of that. And so their right. wisdom, whether it's practical stuff in life, family, marriage, or theologically, church leadership, they've all been there before. And so we desperately need people like that speaking into our lives. So yeah. public service message, I'll just throw that out there. Uh, Bob, in good. terms of in terms of the audience, you know, I think when we when we put a, a book with the word theology in some in front of somebody people automatically get intimidated. They're like, that's only for pastors. That's only for academic people. Uh, so give me kind of that, that wide age, ra age range that you're envisioning for this book. Cause I think it's very accessible for people of, of a wide range of ages, experience levels. And so uh, what's kind of that width or breadth of the audience for this title? Uh, really it's for anybody because there's some older people, ministers too, that don't understand the simplicity. They grew up around preaching and not teaching. And to me, a pastor's role is to teach, not just to preach. Uh, I grew up on preaching. Every sermon was different until I met the first pastor that took over our church and said, I'm going to be teaching for a whole five weeks on the subject of worship. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> really? We're not just going to hit it one time and go on. And he broke the words down and all this. And by the end of that five weeks, I thought, this is incredible. Everybody walked out smarter, but yet he made it to where he could understand it. And um, I think what we need to understand, too, is that I heard this said one time, what you need from old men and uh, old men around the ministry is you need their wisdom, not their ideas. Their wisdom is eternal, but their ideas are about 40 years old. So don't ask them what color walls we need or what kind of furniture to put in the church. They're, they're lost in that time. But the wisdom they have from the word of God, David, David wrote a psalm and said, I once was young, now am I old. And he wrote that entire psalm to young people to understand there's things about life that don't change. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And that's always a good sign. Well, next, Bob, I'd love to have you uh, just give us kind of a, a preview of some of what we're going to encounter in the book in terms of the core themes that it's based around. Uh, you know, just being in church uh, spaces, ministry spaces, a lot of these words will come up in discussions every now and then. And I feel like a lot of people sort of throw their hat into the ring and be part of the conversation. But again, they're lacking that foundation. So they're not really sure if they're talking about the right things. And so that's where I think uh, your book is going to be very helpful. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the idea, the concept of predestination. What okay. is that when somebody's talking about that? What's important for us to know? Uh, predestination has been taken today to extreme. And it's almost like God makes you get saved or makes you not get saved. And your choice really doesn't have that much to do with it. Or that God has put you in a predetermined rut, and you're going to be that way for the rest of your life. There's parameters 
to the sovereignty of God. And in between that, God leaves us on our own. If we start to get too far, he steps in. It's much like a parent. And that's, you know, the parents have a sovereign right that if you're being stupid to come in and help bring you back on the path. In the meantime, those small fluctuations they're able to handle. And that's part of the growing process. What the, the basis for predestination is God's foreknowledge. In fact, when you read it, whom the Lord did foreknow, them he did predestine. And what it's simply saying is God predestined a plan for your life because he foreknew you would accept him. That's the whole point of it was he's not dumb. He looked down the road of time and saw that you would accept him. So he made a plan for you back here based on your choice up there. But he didn't make you choose for him. He knew you would choose for him. My example to women is this. Uh, how many of you women like to, to throw parties? You're, you're given to hospitality. And of course, the hands go up everywhere. I said, how many really love it when people come up and say, oh, your apple pie, do you happen to have a recipe for that? And they go, yeah, it's right here. You know, it's that type of thing. You're so proud of what you've done. But how do you know how many people are going to show up? At the bottom of the invitation, you put four little letters, RSVP. The only, the only one of the few, you know, uh, French things I know, respond to see play. It means just let me know you're coming. And because of that, then whenever the meal comes, you have exactly the right number of plates and you have the name of the person that's going to be there because they let you know they were going to come. How did you know how many plates to set out? You knew how many were coming. But what if you didn't need an RSVP? What if you were God that knows ahead of time who's going to say yes and who's going to say no? So at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the exact number of chairs are going to be there. The exact number of plates will be there. And even if there's names there, it'll be the ones that are going to show up because God knows ahead of time what you're going to do and bases his decision back there on it. So yes, we see whom the Lord did foreknow, he did predestine. And in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, it says uh, also of, of election election based on his foreknowledge. Again, it all comes back to it. It's simple. Prophecy is not God making Antichrist. It's not God forcing the world into a war. He knows what's going to happen. So he made plans and even wrote about it in the Old Testament thousands of years before it happened and let us know it was going to happen. And that's because he knew it was going to happen. He didn't make people reject him. He didn't make Antichrist. He knows the works of Satan. So he tells us ahead of time, that's God's foreknowledge. The greatest strength you have is not physical or even mental. The greatest strength you have is your knowledge. If you know everything, you have all power, and God does. I think uh, one of the places when people encounter predestination and election, they're sometimes not sure if that means they should still go out and evangelize or talk to people about the Lord. So even as we encounter these concepts where people are predestined, they're elect, uh, how should that impact our burden for evangelizing the lost. Predestination means God has a plan for your life after you receive Jesus, and election means he chose you for salvation, but the point was he chose you because he knew what your choice would be, but we have to present them with the choice. It's up to us. Go tell the whole world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Whoever believes will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be damned, but the scripture says whoever is saved, and it's not, not like God's in heaven going, I don't know. No, he knows. And he has a plan. God has a plan for those that accept him. He does not have a plan for those that reject him. For those that reject him, they fall back on their own plans. And their own plans is, no, I think I'm okay. I think my good outweighs my bad. Well, if you don't come to my party and don't RSVP, it must be because you had plans already to go do something else. But I'm not going to make a plan for you. Here's my plan if you accept it. If you don't, and that's what salvation is. God offers the plan to everybody, whosoever will may come. Go tell the entire world about Jesus, but whoever believes will be saved who doesn't. So it's up to me to present it. It's not up to me to make and receive him. It's up to me to present it, to pray for them, to make it simple, and then go on my way. Next, Bob, I'd love for you to speak to propitiation. I don't always hear that one thrown around a lot, especially in conversations on social media. What is that? Why is it important? The word propitiation means satisfaction. The Rolling Stones sang it. Can't get no propitiation. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the word propitiation, which means satisfaction, and it occurred at the mercy seat. Whenever the, the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, God was satisfied. In the Old Testament, temporarily, he was appeased for a moment. And then you had to have another sacrifice, another one. But when Jesus went to the cross and died and his blood was sprinkled, God was eternally propitiated. No more sacrifices. I found the perfect sacrifice, so no more sacrifices are needed. The closest of the five senses attached to propitiation is the sense of smell. 
And when God smelled the offering, he said, ah, I'm, I'm momentarily satisfied. But when Jesus arose from the dead, God went, I'm eternally satisfied. The closest of the five senses attached to your memory is smell, even stronger than seeing and hearing. I tell the story when I was, my wife and I first got married, we went into a grocery store and I saw a cologne on the shelf that I used in high school, cheap as could be. It was JD. I mean, that stuff was so cheap. I opened it up. I bought it and it was like buck 98 or something, took it home, undid the lid and smelled. And suddenly I was no longer standing in the bathroom smelling it. I was in the backseat of a convertible with kids going into the drive-in in high school. It took me back. I mean, I was amazed at how much came back to me because of the smell of that. And when God, today, you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, God goes, and he remembers the cross and says, you're associated with my son. The same smell that happened when my son arose from the dead is now in you. And God is eternally propitiated. He's eternally satisfied with you from that moment. He's never temporarily satisfied with you when you get saved. He's eternally satisfied with you uh, for going to heaven. Now, he may have some things against you today for your actions, but that has nothing to do with you going to heaven. And Bob, the last one I want to have you comment on, uh, if you want to get into some of the others, you're going to have to buy the book. Oh, they're all covered in there. Uh, talk to us about sanctification. What do we need to know about that? Sanctification covers two areas, salvation and your daily walk. All right, you're sanctified before God when you receive Jesus, but you're sanctified before the world when you start living for Jesus. And that's why there's, there's two. So in that case, not everyone has, has a double purpose, but sanctification does. And oftentimes we read a verse about sanctification that you, you, know, you grow in sanctification. People, no, no, you don't grow in sanctification. You're sanctified when you get saved. No, there's a different type of sanctification before the world. It's got to do with your maturing process. And so, yes, I was sanctified before God, seen as saved, seen as totally clean, but I need to start living that in front of the world. So this one before God, I am eternally sanctified the moment I get saved. This one before the world is a growing process. And I learn to grow out of sin. I sin less every day. God's goal over here in my natural life is for me to reach a point where I never sin again. These things write we unto you that you sin not. Now, am I there yet? No, but I'm getting closer. <laughs> you know, when you look at yourself, say, am, am I not sinning anymore? No, you can look back and say, but I've really grown in the last 10 years. I've really got better in the last five years. Am I there yet? No, and you probably won't reach that in life. But that's your goal. I often tell people I'd rather shoot for the moon and miss it than to shoot for the ceiling and make it. Well, I, I like uh, how you explain sanctification. Um, one of the things I encounter with folks is I, I feel like they act like they're not saved unto something or their their journey shouldn't be leading somewhere. And if we're kind of stuck in that same place, I had a great I heard a great illustration uh, last week when I was traveling. Uh, somebody talked about uh, if you were with the Israelites and they crossed the river and if all they did was ever stand there on the bank and just glory and look, we made it across and it's so wonderful. Uh, but there was never any growth past that point. That would be a complete loss. Like there was so much more past that point. So uh, I love I love how you explain sanctification. I think that's really helpful. Um, Bob, overall, the, the reader's journey with theology simplified, like how do you hope they're operating differently, moving differently on the other side of reading this book? What, what would you like to see happening in their life? Simplified and clarified thinking. I now know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking on this, not knowing and trying to make up answers. I know what the Bible says. And really, honestly, when I've read this, this one chapter on, say, propitiation, by the end of that chapter, I go, oh, I understand that. Now, when I teach it, I can explain it to people. To me, the explanation ought to be simple. When I was growing up, me and my friends would walk out of church and say, did you understand a word he said? And we go, oh, no, no. It was so deep. What we said was deep means confusing. Deep ought to mean, no, I, it's understandable. It's simple. That's what the book was written for, to make seemingly complicated things simple. Well, and I will say this is a, a much needed resource. Resources like this are a gift to the church. And so, Bob, I appreciate all the time you put into creating this. Uh, for the listeners, the viewers, any of us who'd like to connect with you, find out more about your ministry, your other books and resources, where are the places we can discover you on the web? Uh, I'm on YouTube, and I'm also on uh, Andrew Womack's uh, TV station, gospeltruth.tv. And so on YouTube, all my art stuff is archived. But also they can contact Bob Yandian Ministries, bobyandian.com. And like we do with every episode, we'll include links in the show notes to places where you can connect with Bob. 
and places where you can pick up a copy of his brand new book as well. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Bobby Andian. Once again, our book today was Theology Simplified, The Eight Foundational Truths of Your Glorious Redemption. And Bob, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us again today. It's always an honor. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Sean.